Lots of lots of fear. Adam, Sean, uh, got the bases covered. Let's learn a little bit about maybe a couple of you out there. Um, if you're like us, you're usually disturbed in the head. You enjoy the Halloween season way too much, and that's okay. We're all bonding together because of it. No one's judging. Let's uh, let's find out a little bit about here. I know we've got. Uh, See how far, how far the someone has come. I know Murray over here in the corner, we met him earlier. He's from Canada. Wanna raise your hand there? Canada. Does anyone I think Toronto. What was it? No. Toronto, Canada. How many miles do you know? Three and a half hours. Three and a half hour flight. We came about nine hundred and ninety miles. We're from Salt Lake, Utah. Salt Lake City, Utah. Anyone else further? San Diego, California. Any of on the miles? Okay. Anyone else? Anyone? Florida, okay. We're getting. Uh, Whoa. Whoa. That's dedication. Okay, anyone? We'll, we'll include flight time or drive time. Anyone beat a 15 hour drive? Okay, the 15 hour drive is going to win, and I'm sorry. Um, this, do you have a computer? All right, this is our CD. We're going we're gonna to ask you one other question. A lot of you came here expecting to buy something. Is there anyone that bought anything or has spent a cumulative greater than $1,000? Anyone else? The only one greater than $1,000, okay. You too need one of these. We need to explain why these two people need what you're all gonna learn. Because every dime you spend here Every minute you spend here is a complete waste of time. It's a complete waste of money, everything that we do. If you don't understand how to apply what you've learned to make your haunt scary. I think we've all seen that manifest in a haunted house that clearly spent big bucks. Lots, lots of money bought the most expensive props out there. Has the biggest warehouse you've ever seen. They, who knows what the lease on that thing got to be incredible. They spent all this money, and you walk through, and you see all these props, and they're, they're hanging up, and this thing's a, a $4,000 prop, and this, this, these actors, they're, they're paid top dollar or whatever. The place is loaded up with, with props. It's loaded up with effects. It's loaded up with everything. Who went on any of the tours the last couple days? Okay, you know what we're talking about then, right? How many thousands of dollars worth of props did we all see? I was, it was jam-packed last night. It was a lot of props. But does it, does it necessarily scare you? You walk through some of these thousand-dollar rooms, and it's not scary. What's the point? Single props, $2,000, and I'd walk through and see. In fact, I've seen single props in a room worth $5,000, and I've walked through and thought they wasted their money on me because I would have been more scared if they just would have turned off the lights. Okay? What's the most afraid you've ever been? Not, not real fear, okay? We want to distinguish. There's, there's, there's two different kinds of fear we're going to talk about. This is the laws of fear. Now, we all know that there's real things to be afraid of in life. But we're talking about haunted houses, okay? I want you to, I want you to write down this acronym, F-E-A-R. You really don't have to write it down because it's in the notes we gave you. <laughs> and it's a simple four-letter word. Okay? Fear stands for false experience appearing real. Because we're talking about trying to put them into an environment that they know is fake. We, everybody knows that the guy can't cut you in half with a chainsaw, right? Everybody knows that the guy in the clown mask is a guy in a clown mask. And yet, we're trying to trick them into believing that there's something to be afraid of. We want to have a false experience appear real to their brains for enough time that, that, we, that they get what they want. Again, that adrenaline. We're trying to help them get adrenaline. Y'all know you're drug pushers, right? You're trying to give them a high. Okay, that's what it's about. Everything else is about trying to get that adrenaline rush. Okay, and it doesn't matter how much you spend on the prop if you don't help them get what they wanted. Okay, so false experience appearing real. The uh, couple examples I think we can all, all think of, have you, been, have you been lost in the woods? You're standing there, you're looking around, maybe you don't know where you are, nothing is happening. You hear the wind, you're walking, you can be terrified. I, I remember one time, I was younger, and I was walking down the stairs, and I was terrified. I, I couldn't make it to the bottom of the stairs. That was a dark basement. 
logically I know there was nothing down there. It was my friend's house, and I've been there a hundred times, but it was late at night, I was alone, and I was walking down the stairs, and I was terrified. Um, if only we could have, it, it's crazy to think that you can spend $10,000 on a elaborate prop that may not scare, and you can just forget to pay the light bill in your lawn, and it might be scary. So, just uh, under understanding there's there's more than just throwing money at the problem. Let's, let's figure out how to, how to scare. And we're gonna talk about that, that particular problem when we get over to distinguishing between gory and scary, okay? Um, start at 3.30, we need to finish by what time? 4.30, okay. Um, before we get into the laws, we need to explain a trick that we're gonna be playing on the brain. All of this comes down to a trick, and the, there's a reason why our brains do what they do, and we want to explain that, okay? In our mind, we really have two pathways that the that a threat is analyzed, okay? You've got the analytical side, and you've got the instinctual side, that knee jerk, that reflex, okay? Should I go illustrate? No, hang on, no. But, well, I will, I will give you an example. I was walking down, I, I went with some, uh, some scouts in my area, and we were walking up this trail, and we knew there were snakes in the area. I went, and I was walking along, and all of a sudden I went and I stepped on a snake, or I went to step on a snake, and as soon as I saw that snake, I jumped back and screamed like a girl, okay? Now, that was the instinctual part, right? That's that startle that we're trying to help them get. I, I guarantee I had adrenaline. I had the adrenaline rush that I wanted. So as soon as that instinctual ha part happened, the next thing that happened was my, my upper part of the brain, the analytical part of the brain, started to analyze this, this snake. And it sat there and went, wait, 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 wait a second, that's a stick. Okay? So the instinctual part of our brain is easy to trick. The analytical part of the brain takes a second, it's a slow response, it takes a second to analyze, and then that part of the brain will start to say, easy, slow down, calm down, it's okay, it's just a stick. That's what we're using. Everything that the haunter does is all about trying to hit the instinctual part of the brain, trying to make it so that that part of the brain is easily tricked, quickly tricked, and hit several times. And then we try and make enough things happen at the same time that they are constantly having to reanalyze and say, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 it's okay. So it's quick to, quick to hit, slow to slow down, and easy to trick, hard to, again, calm down. Okay, so we're, we're talking about those pathways. We're going to bring, when we talk about preying on multiple senses, we're going to talk about how to create more of a traffic jam in that analytical part of the brain. Let's jump into the meat of it. Go for it. We, here, we came here to learn about the laws of fear. Let's talk about the laws of fear. First little icon over here, if you have the little handout, he's the guy with the hula hoop. Um, this is to represent removing their comfort zone. The hula hoop, I guess, is representative of their comfort zone. In reality, perhaps it should have been a bubble. It should be a little guy in a gerbil cage, and that, that area around you, the gerbil cage, is their comfort zone. For some bizarre reason, People come to your haunt because they want to get, they want to get scared. And, and out of their comfort zone, I heard they, both. And they show up and the first thing they say is, I'm not going to get scared. You can't scare me. None of this is real. And they, they start developing this self-talk. This They're telling themselves it's not real because for, for whatever reason, there's this conflict of interest going on. They show up at a place to get scared and they're not going to let that happen. No way. Um, it's our civic duty, though. To that does happen. First thing we need they to do. They pay good money. We're supposed to do that. We are, yeah, yeah, we're okay. We're not liable. The, this comfort zone that is set up, the barriers they have around them, the first thing we need to do is we need to tear that down. Now, some of the comfort zones they have, they show up with their friends. They show up with, with uh, some sort of a support group, their peers, because they know the guy in the front of the line gets scared and they're going to be okay because they're standing in the back. And they've, they've developed this this comfort zone of peers. Some of the things they're self-talk they can use. They'll, they convince their minds and tell themselves, that's a latex mask, that's not real, that's just a person. I, there's a person behind that, and, and they talk themselves out of it. Um, some of the things we need to do, and all, all the laws can tie in together, and we'll cover that in the last sec. But 
when we get in their, their comfort zone or the tear down, there's a few ways that we can do that. He talked about friends that people bring in. There's a couple other barriers. I noticed last night, and a lot of, I, I know a lot of us spend a lot of money on our props, and we want to build a barricade. We were talking with a few of our friends last night about how do you um, remove their comfort zone and yet protect your props. That's a hard line to, that's, that's kind of a balancing act. You've got to figure out for yourself how much are you willing to invest in a prop that you're going to put too far back to really be effective. You've got to decide that. Um, so barriers, distance, and direction. Okay, those are the comfort zones we're going to talk about. Distance and direction. If that, like you said, that's a, a hula hoop. It goes around you 360 degrees, but I want you to picture it going around 360 degrees this way, around this way, around this way. Okay, it's, it is a bubble that goes around them. Um, Y'all subscribe to Haunted Attraction Magazine, I hope. If you don't, you should. That was shameless, wasn't it? It's true, though. It's true, though. Um, and in that, if you've seen this, this article right here, then you have seen our first article. Leonard published it, The Laws of Fear, to Remove the Comfort Zone. We have a little diagram over here that you'll see. All it is is a bunch of circles, and it gives an example of what the comfort zones are. When, well, okay, there's a couple different comfort zones. The big one is at about 12 feet. As you're walking down the street, that is your public distance. At about 12 feet is where you're comfortable, and if somebody comes past you, you and I are walking past down the street, if he comes into my 12-foot radius, that's when I give him the nod, hey, you know? <laughs> that's the acknowledgement, because he has come into my public distance, okay? Then, if he comes in within my four foot, about, about as far as I can reach, four foot bubble, that's my personal space. Now personal space is, you, it's personal. You need to know the person that's in that personal space. Okay, we've got a lot of men and women, but you're gonna be able to understand this. Urinals, okay? There's, there's an unwritten rule that if a guy is standing at one urinal, the other guy has to be in that urinal over there. You don't come in to that personal space unless every single urinal is used. Okay? Another example is the elevator. You all walk, all walk into the elevator, right? The first guy walks in, and where does he go? The back corner. That's right. Okay? Now, the second guy walks in, and he'll go to this other corner. Try something. Okay? Face him and walk straight and stand right there. Okay? Especially if your face is painted like this. Yeah, that'll go over well. <laughs> okay? Now you're in their personal space. Okay? The last one is about 18 inches around you, and that's your intimate distance. That's where, you know, your wife, your kids, you can, you can hug them and hold them and things like that. Or, if you're, you know, last night, some of these guys in clown masks, they get right up into that intimate distance. Okay? That's important. You want to remove the comfort zone and let them know that that space is not sacred. I think everybody knows this, okay? You know that they've gotta get up in there. But the place where we don't know it is we, we build our props, and where do we put them? We build a barrier, and then we put the prop back over here, and then we say, you walking through there need to be scared by my prop. Now, it wasn't in their space. All it was was something visual that they can enjoy, okay? So you've gotta figure out how you wanna get those props close enough, and, it, and actually I'm going to talk about that in Synergy, where really all the prop is is a decoy anyway. That's really what any of your props are, is the decoy for the gotcha. Okay, we'll talk about that more. Okay, so we talked about distance, not direction. Direction means above, below, side, side, there needs to be, you've got to break down the belief that there's any safe place. What's the difference between a movie and a haunted house? What's that? Movie's up on the screen. It's in front of you, and that's it, right? And the haunted house is every direction. And we don't use that. I've walked through way too many of them that they, they put things out where I can see them in this line of sight. By the way, there's a 30 degree rule. You all know that people have neck paralysis in, in haunted houses, okay? So if you put your prop off on this side, then keep in mind their, their neck is paralyzed, they're not gonna see it. You've gotta actually physically turn their body so that they'll see it, 
make it so that they're walking around corners to see what you want them to see. But the, um, the direction, you need to remove the belief that they're ever safe so that they're always anticipating something could happen from above, something could happen from below, something could happen from behind the wall, behind me, it doesn't matter. You've got to remove that comfort zone. We beat that one to death? Let's see. Okay. Talking about movies, movies have some, some limitations that that's an obvious fact. They've got the brother. The uh, movie screen up in front of you, what do they use? They understand the fact that they do have limitations, especially in a scary movie or a movie they want to pull you in. What's another way that they use to pull you into the movies? Surround sound. Now before, you know, it was sound and then it broke off into stereo sound. Now surround sound, they realized we, we can immerse them in the motion picture experience. George Lucas, I'm sure everyone's heard of that, um, with his Skywalker sounds. There is uh, the sound department in the movie studio. Uh, get on his website, there's some pretty neat stuff you can learn about sound. He talks about the motion, motion picture experience, saying sound is 50% of the motion picture experience. Now in hauntings, sound is probably more than 50%, and I think sight is probably around 50%, and you've got... And touch and smell touch are also smell 50%, 50% at least. least. We have a whole bunch of senses, so what, we, what brings us to our next little icon here, the three ways merging into one. This is training on multiple senses. We have all of these tools at our disposal. We can use sight, we can use sound, touch, uh, we can use... Now actually, talking about this, I think the one that's probably most used is sight. You walk into the display room next door and there are a hundred vendors there selling visual products. And there are a couple that are selling maybe a tactile product, something that we can touch. There are a couple that are using your, uh, the audio, and we thought sa smell is one that's probably not used very much. And it was interesting. We were actually in there, and the gentleman, he threw a couple little packets at us, and he said, hey, I, I was reading through your seminar, and look, you guys are talking about the, the scents. We use, we, we use smells. And he, he let me smell a couple. You all been over to Sinister, Sinister Sands? You smell them? Those are horrible. I love them. That, <laughs> did, did you smell the hippo's breath? I'm not going to, oh, that, oh yeah. Yeah. I woke up last night just in convulsions. I could still smell it, almost taste it. It was horrid. But uh, one of my favorites, I asked him if he could drop off a couple packets and we'll throw them out so you can experience it. This rainforest, this damp, this dust. Who hasn't smelled one yet? The rainforest. Hand, give some, some out to the hands. Throw, throw a couple of these around, smell them. And, Pass them, we'll throw them back here. Pass them around a little bit, smell them. It, it makes a really, you know, more, makes a pretty interesting experience. Maybe package back this side. If you smell it, it, it smells kind of gross. It's something that's often overlooked. Maybe you should, we'll, we'll, we'll spend just a, just a minute on it. Yep, you're jumping on, ahead. On scent. The, uh, the Ring. Seen the movie The Ring, anybody? Hold it, up. You're jumping ahead. I'm going to jump ahead. All right. I'm standing here with a pen. I, I've got to do something. My, my brother, Sean, here would like to explain something that's a little <laughs> more boring. We're going to talk about all the senses and why it is important. As, as we break them down, we you obviously know that we've got five senses, five primary senses. Um, taste. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about taste. Okay. I hope you don't spend much time trying to scare their tastes. But smell, sound, touch, and sight. Now, the brain, again, this okay, technical alert. Okay, I'm going to get a little bit... I like using big words sometimes. Um, the brain, I really get excited about the way the brain works. Most of you know the brain is in two hemispheres, but you, did you also know that the brain is in multiple lobes? And those lobes all have different functions, okay? Um, the, the way that the brain processes the senses that we have, our, our nose is processed by our olfactory bulb, which is just a little bulb kind of straight back behind your nose. But the sense of hearing, is, t is in the temporal lobes on the sides out here, okay? The temporal lobes on the side for your hearing. Your sense of touch is in the parietal lobe across the top. It's kind of the top middle right there. And the sense of sight is processed in the back by the occipital lobe back here. And all of these, every single one of them come from a different direction of the brain and they're actually processed by the same little organ, okay? I'm not going to go into what those all are, but every single one of those go into the same place to determine whether it is a threat or not a threat. Everything
everything that you're experiencing, it's all going in through all of these different senses, and then it's getting sent down into this little place that gets to do the two things that we talked about before. So it comes down into this little spot, and it says, instant, if, if it thinks it's a threat, if it even thinks it's a threat, it's gonna give you that instinct, instinctual response. Then at the same time, it's gonna send that up above to the higher parts of the brain to analyze it. But the thing is, is it's all coming in from different directions to determine whether or not, should I, should, should I react, should I fight, flight, or not respond, okay? So that's why we're talking about a traffic jam. We're trying to get a traffic jam all of these different senses need to be bombarded at some level in order to create a traffic jam where this guy's saying, send everything down here because we don't have enough time to analyze it. Okay? Now we're going to talk a little bit about the how do, how do you prey on multiple senses? A little more practical application. Um, things that we can use, I, I, think, I think sight's pretty well established. Everyone understands that they can see things and everyone has something you can see. Well, Sight is pretty well established, but let's see, who has one of my, let me borrow that big. If you look in the back page, let's see. In Distinguish Between Gory and Scary, we've actually written down, we, we went on to hauntworld.com and they had a survey that they'd done. They had over 4,000 respondents, 4,000 people like you and me, that came on and they took this great big long survey and they asked them what really scares you. The question they asked is, what scares you most? And out of 4,500 people, what did they say? When I can't see anything or the unexpected. In other words, when we're talking about the sense of sight, what scares you most? When I can't see anything, when I don't know what's around the corner, when I don't know what's about to happen, okay? So the sense of sight, you gotta keep in mind, the, the props that we're setting up are nothing more than the, the decoy, okay? That's the decoy so that they've got their attention on something so that you can nail them from somewhere else. A good example of this may be it, it actually using multiple sites, the move, or the move, multiple senses. The movie Jaws, we've all seen Jaws. We're most scared when we don't see the shark. We're, we're looking at a screen full of empty water. We're terrified, terrified of this water. Why? Because they use the we're all very familiar with that. You sit in the pool and that, that music starts playing and you just want to get out. You don't see it, but, but this, uh, this sound kind of generates a response. It's a terrifying response. So you can kind of use them and use them together, obviously. Things that we can't see. You can, you can see things. They can jump out and scare you. And obviously, you wouldn't see them. But when we use sound, there's a couple different types of sound we'll talk about. There's ambient noise. And that's the stuff that's going on in the, the background. That's white noise. That's just, just the hum of the screams that are off in the distance. Those really aren't going to scare you. It just kind of generates a really nice atmosphere to scare. There's sound effects we can use. Uh, music is a great one we can use. That we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about that in our next uh, law as well. Using music to, to really build up the tension. What are some of the, the sounds that we can use that we can uh, hopefully bombard with some sight? some sound, throw in some smells so that they become immersed in the experience and have a hard time processing what really is, is the threat. Now, he just said something really important. How often are you immersed in the experience? Okay? When we're talking about the sound, I, I really love, there's a lot of sound out there, a lot of music, a lot of sound effects I really enjoy. Uh, we were just talking to Ed Douglas of the Midnight Syndicate. We really enjoy his stuff. We've used it for a lot of years. Um, but the thing that I've often noticed, and I noticed in a couple of the haunts we've been to recently, is even if they have a good sound, soundtrack or sound effects, how distracting is it to hear, okay? You know that they're animatronics, but don't remind me, okay? Make sure that the sound effects are the primary sound that I'm hearing. And, and I, get, I get in there and I'll, I'll hear the soundtrack and they'll have it on a speaker back in that corner. And by the time I get over here, it's, it's in the background and I almost forget that I'm hearing any kind of a soundtrack. And all I can hear is the, is the animatronic effect or the guy over three rooms over saying, oh, <laughs> you know, make sure that the, the decibel level is high enough throughout your haunt, the whole darn thing. Think about, again, any movie you watch and tell me if there's ever a place where they forget to keep the, the soundtrack levels up. 
you've got to be thinking about it just like you would a movie. If you're, if you're orchestrating your, your movie, that soundtrack is going to be very consistent throughout. Make sure that you're doing the same thing in your audience. Now the idea obviously is we keep it consistent, we keep things moving so that they become immersed in the experience. If they forget about it, they drop down to ground zero and we have to build them back up. One of our next things to talk about, mm -hmm. we still got touch. Oh, touch. Oh, let, some of the things we talked about, touch. We as actors, as we're in the haunt, I mean you want to get in their personal space, it becomes very awkward sometimes, you know, when you get up in some, some sort of an intimate distance with them. I mean, he wasn't very uncomfortable, I was uncomfortable. But uh, <laughs> I won't do that again. <laughs> oh, where was it? About 12 feet. Yeah, that's, that's, that's about comfortable. The, uh, we as actors, we cannot touch them. We can, we can make them believe that we are going to touch them. And now you can establish beforehand, maybe have a, an actor played out that he's, he's being strangled or something. And then he can come at you. He's not going to strangle you, but you've, you've established in your mind that he's going to. He does strangle people. He doesn't actually have to touch you to invade you. Kind of doesn't really invade your, your, your space as much as it invades your mind. For the actors, we all know that we don't want the actors to touch the, the patrons because of the different problems that can, that can create. But you want to use touch. Now, what are some of the ways that you can use touch? Let's see. Nightmare on 13th. Is Mike here? Okay, I can talk about him then. <laughs> I went to, uh, in Salt Lake, Nightmare on 13th, I really loved it, and he did some good things using the sense of touch. Um, some examples, one of, the, one of the things I like to do, I like to hang things that are, that they're gonna touch you. One of, I love hanging chains because they're heavy. You know, you gotta push against chains and have to walk through chains. Um, in Nightmare on 13th, one of my favorite effects, or almost favorites, that's why I need to know if he's here so I can tease him about it. Um, they had a, a closet that you had to walk through. And all it was was a long closet with a lot of shirts that were kind of the long way and they were really tight. And so in order to walk through this closet, you had to push through these shirts, okay? Now, first of all, my, my uh, distance and direction, my comfort zone was completely gone because these things are pushing against me and I can feel the, the heavy weight of these things. Go ahead. Well, you raised your hand, so you interrupted us. <laughs> Yes. That's very good. I was, she, what she said was that they were they had hanging body bags. I love that effect where you've got to you've got to walk through and push through these body bags. Nightmare on Thirteenth did the exact same thing this last year, and I I liked it. It really got me out of my comfort zone. Um, and this. This other effect was the same, similar uh, feeling, where I was pushing through these shirts, and uh, I mean, they're pushing against me. I, I was, it was a tight, closed space, so I was claustrophobic. The weight got into my space, and I couldn't see, you know, more than just a, a few feet in front of me, and so I knew something was gonna grab me. I knew, I was so tense. We're gonna talk about that here, okay? How do you get their tension up, and what's the process you use there? So anyway, so using the sense of touch, Hang, you know, hang things. What's a, my favorite sense of touch? I, we spend all these times building these huge elaborate props, props and I interview with people at the end of the haunts that we go to, and I ask, what was your, what, where, where were you the most scared? Oh, the compressed air. <laughs> that feeling of that air hitting you, the sound, all of those things at the same time, that's, that's one of the, you know, everybody jumps at that. So, you gotta stick with the basics sometimes. That's right, turn the lights off, blow air on them, you're good, save you. Everything beyond that is pure profit. Beautiful. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> He's saying he didn't like when they were breathing. Oh, they probably paid him not to have good breath, you know? <laughs> Let's, let's talk about smell for a second. We went to a, a haunt where y'all know Samara from The Ring, right? The movie The Ring. My, I took my son to a haunt this last year and we were, we were actually doing a, a walkthrough and um, I was recording everything and doing, uh, doing a service for these folks. And we got into this room and, and this girl, she got right up into my face and she was, you know, it was great, well-decorated and stuff. And 
my son leans over to me and she goes, he goes, she smells good. <laughs> She's been rotting in a well for seven days, but at least she shampooed this morning. And put on right, so, you know, if you're going to be rotting in the well, you know, maybe, maybe they should put on cologne if they're going to be clowns that are in the, <laughs> you know, decaying. Um, okay, so we've talked about touch, smell, sight, sound. Anything? I guess the only, the only other thing about sight, and we mentioned most people seem to cover that pretty good. We're going to talk to anyone who's an actor or wants to be an, is an aspiring haunt actor. Dedication. Now, when it comes to sight, I think, like we said, most people have pretty big elaborate things and there's a lot to see and nice effects and nice, uh, nice ambience all the way around. One haunt. Adam, uh, I got it. Adam knows my pet peeve. Um, we have a brother. Well, we have all of our actors that have ever worked with us are pretty dedicated. We've done effects where we've done, uh, you know, acid spilling on their bodies and stuff, and he's been willing to shave off half his head and his eyebrows and stuff like that. We've had actors that have come to us and said, "I've had this mustache for ten years. I can't shave it off." We said, "Well, then you can't be that." He said, oh, "Okay, gone." Well, I went through a haunt a couple years ago where the, they had a gorgeous uh, manor facade. They had out in front a guy who was in a full tux. He had a nice skull uh, makeup piece. And what it was was one of those half, half, you know, half head things with the cheekbones and stuff. But he wouldn't shave his mustache. So, I, I don't know. It's just a pet peeve. Yeah, I don't if know. You're gonna if your actor's going to be, if they're not going to be dedicated, then find a different part, find a different ass. part. That's completely off the subject. Yeah, if, I don't know if anyone knows about decomposition, but you know, the mustache usually doesn't stay. Sure it does. Well, I mean, after the whole skeleton has been dried and things to the sun. Yeah, I think it does, doesn't it? Is the mustache there? I think the, in fact, your hair keeps growing. <laughs> okay, let's talk about escalating the tension. I was, I was giving you the example of the, I was walking through the, sh the shirts, okay? I was walking through these shirts, and so they'd done everything right up to this point. They had... My space was invaded. This, they were using multiple senses. It was dark, it was, it was tight. It was, I could feel the weight of the thing on me, and I was tense, right? I was right there, and I knew that all it was gonna take, and I, I've been doing this for 23 years. I knew that I was gonna get scared. Y'all know that point where you know if somebody comes out, I'm there. So I walked through this thing. Our, our icon here is a, is a jack in the box. You've all heard the jack in the box. Give them the jack in the box. I think we're familiar with the ding, 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 There's the whole overview of it. Okay, he just illustrated the three points of, of escalating the tension. Okay? The first is establish a credible threat. The second is... What is it? Crescendo? Crescendo, thank you. And then the third is resolve. Okay, we'll talk about those three things. Establish a credible, credible threat, crescendo, and resolve. Do it again. That's exactly what I felt at the end of this closet. Okay, they had me. They brought me up to that point, and then I walked out, and I went, ah. There was no resolution. There was no punch, okay? Now, that was only one time, but I, I thought, oh, they had me. They could have got me. So, so then I went to the next effect, and I was walking through this room, and they had, it was just the black light room, and they had the guys in the, in the masks and stuff, the Jason masks, and I couldn't see, and no one was moving, and I thought, one of these things is real. You know one of them's real. So I walked through there, and I was ready for something to jump, Nothing. Okay? If you're going to do everything right up to that point, why did they come? They wanted that last punch. They wanted that last uh, startle. Okay? When we're talking about scared, really what people are thinking about is, is the startle. Um, Leonard talks about a, a high or low bore, high startle haunt. The startle is really all we can deliver. We're not going to be able to help them feel afraid that their family is going to be in a car accident or anything like that. We're not creating that kind of fear. We're creating a fear of the, 
you know, that startle. And then a high anxiety throughout the whole hunt. We want them to stay tense, anxious, with a couple startles. And so the first, the first one we said is establishing a credible threat. That's what removing the comfort zone is. As you go through and you start showing them that the, the scare is going to come from above, the scare is going to come from the sides, it's going to come from below, it's going to be a one-two punch, and you never know what's going to be around the corner, now you've, now you've created, you've established a credible threat. A great example of this, they use this in movies all the time, there is a villain at the very beginning, when they always show the villain and he breaks out and he's doing something impossible, he does something, he destroys the city, he oh, does he's something, a monster. a monster, he's a monster, a horrible, ghoulish monster, and he shows up at the very beginning, he shows what kind of power he has and what he can do, and this way he establishes what he's capable of. This credible threat is there, so then we know when our hero has to face him at the end, we understand what kind of a challenge there is, and there's a heightened tension, there's an anticipation there, because we think that monster can level buildings, and now our hero has to go up against that, and if your hero, or if your monster loses at the beginning, it's not a very, there's not much of a threat there. Has anybody seen Rocky IV? Rocky IV. Ivan Drago, the Russian. Okay. You remember at the beginning of Rocky IV, what did Ivan Drago do? He killed the world champion. So that when Rocky went up against him, you knew what he was capable of, right? They established a credible threat at the beginning. That's so what, what we're talking about. In our haunts, we need to show them what we're capable of. Now do it as soon as, as, soon as you possibly can. As soon as they come in to your haunt, don't let them get comfortable, don't let them analyze, scare them from the top, scare them from the sides, just scare them to death as soon as you possibly can, because once you've scared them from the top, he's walking through, walking through a tunnel, and you see a big whatever, a big monster hanging above you, now it may be a prop, it may not be a prop, he doesn't know, but he knows, you've already told him, I can scare you from the top. We have actors that jump down on top of you, so he has to walk under this guy, and now you can do nothing. Now you don't have to have him drop because, because he's going to stay anxious and excited because he knows he could. That's what we're talking about. And now this is a great opportunity. Once he gets right through there, maybe he's done, he might relax his mind, think, well, this guy's not going to do anything. What a great time to, to, to blow an air, air, air compressor, jump from the side, jump from the other, whatever, because he's, his attention is all on the top and he knows he's going to get scared. And you do, you scare him, and there, it's so easy to scare, to scare somebody when they're waiting to be scared. Yeah, again, remember the decoy and the gotcha. So as you've established your credible threat at the beginning, now you can go through and use that as a pattern to start creating the decoys so that they think they know what you're about to do, and that's when you do the other thing. So the three parts, again, establishing that credible threat, threat we need to crescendo it. And when the guy's walking underneath there, what if the music on the side gets a lot more intense? This, this driving beat starts going and his heart starts you're racing. you're making a movie. I mean, that's exactly what they do. In the movies, the, the music gets louder. Think of the Jaws. What happens? It starts out quiet. Dun, 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 dun. It gets louder. It gets faster. You know, the tempo goes up. Dun, 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 dun. You haven't seen anything, but you know it's going to happen. And so they've, they've, they have created the, uh, they've established a credible threat. You know he could eat somebody because he ate the swimmer at the beginning of the movie. Then you hear that there's this crescendo, and now when you finally have the resolve, it's more satisfying. And that's what we're going to talk about at the end. I'm going to throw out a word at the beginning so that you know, know when it comes. Startle potentiation. Has anybody ever heard startle potentiation before? Cool, I'll be able to explain it here in a few minutes, okay? So the three parts, obviously, is we crescendo it, we resolve it, this is how we make a, this, I guess that's kind of the recipe of a, of a, of a scare. They use it in movies, they understand it's, a, it's something that we can repeat. We don't have to just throw props in there and think, well, I don't know, and hopefully they just wander through and get scared by it. Got a question here. What do you mean by desensitizing them? Keep it random, is what I would be. His question is, how do you keep it from desensitizing? Uh, I think if you walk into a room, Every time you walk in a room, someone jumps from your right and scares you and you're dressed like a clown. Every time you walk in a room, oh, there's another doorway. You're probably going to peek around. You don't walk through. You're not going to be scared. One time you might walk in and you, you're standing there. Hello. And the guy grabs you from behind. Yeah, you jump, you turn around, you see him from behind. Now you're scared. Oh, well, and you remember we were talking about 
uh, at the beginning, if you will establish that credible threat, the next time you don't have to do anything, and may, sometimes you shouldn't. You should you should just create you should keep them in a heightened state heightened state of anxiety for a long period of time. You can maintain that for a long time, and that's how you keep them desensitizing them. Is you keep them anxious for as long as you can, and then make sure you do have a punch periodically. But it should like you. You don't want to desensitize them. You don't want to hit boom, 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 boom. I, I teach my kids the same thing. If you, if you sit there and hit in one place, it'll eventually, you'll stop getting any kind of sensitivity there. You don't want to do that. You need to hit them there, then hit them there, then hit them there. You know? See, in, in my family, I've got a little kid. He's about two years old. His name's Cole. He's got beautiful blue eyes and blonde hair. And he's a joy. And he's a lot of fun. And he loves when daddy comes home to play hide and seek and, and peekaboo. I, I think everyone has kids probably can understand and relate with that. Well, they wanted to play hide and go seek, and I was okay with that. And I thought it'd be fun if we turn on scary music and turn down the lights and get everyone to play. <laughs> Again, I'm a little more more than others, and that's okay. We, we can all relate. Um, and well, anyways, he's hiding with his mom, and we're, they're having a lot of fun. Well, the lights were off, and it was my turn to hide. Now, I take things way too far. I play with a two-year-old, and I climbed on top of my fridge in the dark <laughs> to scare me. <laughs> Okay, I, I took it way too far, and that's okay, because I was up there, and they're wandering along, and after a while, they're like, he's, I, I, they've looked everywhere under pillows and cushions, and they have no idea. They know I'm out there, but they have no idea. And he starts crying, because he's thought, he thinks this game's no, no fun anymore. Well, I'm still playing. I'm having a good time. I noticed my wife now comes to the fridge to fix him a glass of, or a bottle of milk. What a perfect opportunity to keep it random again. And, uh, and break things, break down all the barriers. She comes in for milk, and I just grab her on the top of the head. <laughs> I've been sleeping on the couch for a while. My back is recovering, but uh, you know it's a, it's a great way. If you, if you do keep it, you spice it up, you keep it random. They understand. You know the peekaboo game gets old because they know what's going to happen. You drop it, you mix it up a little bit. Okay, we're going to have to move on. We're, we're how are we doing? Down ten minutes or so. I think. Ten minutes. We still ten more minutes. Um, let's move on to distinguishing between gory and scary. This kind of ties in with the sense of sight. Remember we talked about what really is scary is when you don't see anything, but gore is part of this business. We all know blood, gore, you know, there's really nothing wrong with that. In our business, I'm okay with it. We had some of our favorite effects uh, this last couple years ago. We've torn Adam's heart out. Uh, we've impaled him, we've hung our brother from chains. We, I think those are kind of cool. We don't think they are, but some people say they are. Um, but we need to distinguish between what, what those things are for. Okay? Um, why off. is it cheesecake? I, I love cheesecake, personally. I'm, I'm a pretty good little cook. When I get the, I, there's a few things I make really well. Cheesecake is one of them. I do have some really good cheesecake recipes, and I'm a little picky about my cheesecake. One thing I enjoy. Now, when you're making the cheesecake, you're supposed to do it right. You make, you use the right ingredients and the best ingredients, and you mix it properly, and, if, and then you bake it at the right time, at the right temperature, at the right altitude, and you cool it down the right way, and if you do it right, the top stays nice and smooth. If you do it wrong, say you use the- Is it really a wrong cheesecake? Well, all right. You, you beat the, the batter too long, and it breaks up the inconsistency, or it breaks up the consistency of the batter. When you pull it out, if you, if you put the wrong ingredients, or should I, inferior, I hate using that word, it makes me seem stuck up, but inferior ingredients. Um, big on cheesecake. You, you pull it out, you, you, you cool it down, and the top will just crack. It's covered with cracks all the way through it because it cooled down, well, what, what is cooling down, the, the imperfections are then shown. Now what people do, I guess if you ever go to a cheesecake competition or something like that, what, what they will do is they'll take a starchy, sugary, goofy, cherry-filled topping, and they just bleh, Goop it all over the top and spread it around, and then no one can see the little crack. It's not, you can't tell, you can't tell. No, if you do it. Now again, there's nothing wrong with using a topping. I'll still use topping on a cheesecake if it comes out nice and smooth. But the difference is, one is to cover up what was done improperly, and one is to enhance what was done well. What we use with gore is the exact same thing. If, if the scare is set up properly, walk into a room and gore is involved, hopefully it is there simply to enhance the scare that's, that's coming. And they're gonna, you're going to get punched hard and it's, it's going to be a fantastic scare and a fantastic moment. The defenses are all down and then it's built up properly. The gore can enhance, it certainly can. We, we try to use, and we use 
There are some rooms we walk in and maybe there's not enough. I've seen a lot of rooms where I've thought, this needs a little more blood on the walls. But at the same time, we've walked into probably more and seen that there's nothing scary here if they're just trying to bludgeon me with gore. Okay? And I'm, I'm pretty okay with it, except for that it wasn't scary. And that's what we're here talking about. How do you make it scary rather than just gory? Okay? Uh, we're not going to beat that one to death, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll continue on to the last one and the most important. Um, and that is creating synergy between your effects. Synergy is, a simp is kind of the business term that means 2 plus 2 equals 5 or 10 or 50. It's, it's when you take a bunch of little pieces and you combine them for something that's greater than the individual parts. Now, I mentioned the word, or the, the phrase, startle potentiation. Synergy is the business term. Potentiation is actually the chemical term. I'm sorry, technical alert again. It's the, it's the chemical term, and all that means is that if you take this chemical and you take this chemical and you put them together, you have something that's explosive, okay? What we're talking about is potentiating the startle by bringing all of these things together so that they are um, tense to begin with, and there are, there are a lot of psychological experiments that are being done out there in a lot of different universities where they are trying to determine what kind of things potentiate startle. I was going to get scared anyway when the buzzer went off, but what, if, what can you do to make it so that I get really scared when the buzzer goes off? The same buzzer is going to go off, but my mindset was different up to that point. And that's what we're talking about, is if you can develop a mindset, keep that, that um, anxiety level high by all of the things that we're talking about, then when the startle finally does happen, it's a much more effective and much more enjoyable for the victim startle. Okay? No. That's one type of, of synergy that we're talking about. Um, we, we mentioned at the beginning that the laws tend to mesh pretty well. If, if you're using one, you have to probably use a second one to enhance it. it. It's hard to use one thing if your haunt has nothing but, it can't just use one law of fear because that will, it will leave it alone, it will just dry up and die. They kind of feed off of each other. That's what we really need to, to assemble, use these things to really generate a great haunt. In, there, there's a quote, I've talked about movies a bit, uh, in screenwriting, kind of the, you're into screenwriting writing, there's a great book by Lou Hunter, he talks about screenwriting, and there is a quote that he talks about structure. When you're building a screenplay, it's, it's structure, it's, it's, that's, that's how, it, how a story will play, a movie will play, because it's based on structure. He talks about, in life, things happen one after another. Structure is when things happen because of the other. Now that's kind of what we're talking about. We can, there's two ways to approach a haunt. We can go and grab thousands of dollars of props, and we can throw them in a room. A dark room. Yeah, we gotta dim those lights. Dim the lights for the room. We can turn on the radio and have some sound effects going, and then we just start kicking people in, and man, we hope, we hope it's happened. Something in there maybe worked, maybe didn't. And then next year, we gotta hopefully throw it in the right room. Again. Yeah, if it works, if then it works. do you know why it worked? And if it didn't work, do you know why it didn't work? That's what we're talking about to say we need to develop a structure so that everything in your haunt is building up to, to the scare. Then you create the decoy so that their, their attention is on something. Then you create the startle. Then you use that startle to establish a credible threat for the next startle. Then you use every single one of these and escalate and ex escalate and escalate until at the very end, you have something, something better than the chainsaw. I guess everybody likes it, but something that's the best, you know, something that they really leave screaming. That's why we talk about brainstorming too. Come up with something original. Everybody's out there doing the same thing and all of the people are out there knowing that we're all doing the same thing. But if you'll understand the, the principles that we're talking about, not the how-to, what we're talking about, but the principles behind what we're talking about, then you'll be able to come up with a structure that will cause people to get what they want. People to come back, they'll tell their friends, they'll tell their friends, if you really want the haunt, you'll go down the street to those guys. So we can, we're all, we all invest a lot, probably too much time, according to our spouse, too much money um, into, into haunts to leave it all to chance. 
If we're, if we're going to do it, wouldn't it be nice to know that we're in control? We can sit back and say, that is a well set up home. That is perfect. Th those rooms work together so well. Instead of just having one room after another room, after another random room, after another room in our haunt. It's a structure that we can duplicate today, I can duplicate next year, I can duplicate in, in outdoor haunt and indoor haunts, going through single, going through the group. I understand what scares people and I can control it, I can duplicate it, and uh, I'm sure it's much nicer to have control of your, uh, your haunts than just leave it to chance. We invest way too much just 